Kevin and Sherry, welcome to uh, our first Organic Disciples Shoreline podcast. This is exciting, yeah. this new way to launch the, the new year. I'm very excited about what we're going to learn and how we're going to grow as a church this year. And uh, so I'm going to be learning along with everybody else during this time. And so, as always, we'll have some conversations. I'll ask you some questions and Great. answer them how you see fit. Yeah. Thanks well, for being here today. One of the fun things that you, you've been part of as part of this pastoral staff team, part of creating a lot of what we're going to be talking about. So it's fun to talk about it together. I'm telling everybody I almost wrote a book. You know? There you go. <laughs> I came this, My name's in there. I was this close. <laughs> Except for the part about writing the words and stuff. I nailed it. <laughs> hey, we're happy to be here with you, Keith. Yeah. It's a pleasure to serve with you. Glad to have you here. And I'm happy to be here with Sherry. Oh, good. <laughs> well, we're going to be talking about organic disciples, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and this is about growing to be more like Jesus, yeah, right? Absolutely. Um, can you tell me about or tell us about someone who's walked with you mm -hmm. that has helped you to uh, grow to be more like mm -hmm. Jesus? Yeah. There's so many people to choose from, but one I'm just going to share. I, I gave her acknowledgement in in our book. Her name is Alice Berry. She's actually just passed away a couple of months ago, but I had her as a fifth grade Sunday school teacher. Wow. And she made a huge impact on my life. And then obviously being in the same church, I saw her growing up uh, more. But in fifth grade, um, she shared one Sunday about how if we were ever afraid that all we needed to do was just to say the name Jesus. And as a fifth grader, I just took that truth. Mm. It went deep in my heart and it really transformed mm. the way I walked with Jesus from then on. And then not only just me, but I have told hundreds and hundreds of people what she shared with me and it's changed other people's lives too. And so while I didn't spend a lot of time with her, I actually counted her as one of the most um, important people in my lives because I just had her as a Sunday school teacher. She discipled me in a powerful way, just teaching in Sunday school. That's yeah. sweet. Yeah. 25 years later, it's still impacting you. Exactly. That's right, yeah. Keith. That's wow. why I love you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You're so good. Keith, for me also. And I think anybody who's walked with Jesus for many years, if they look back, they can see people that have take their hand and kind of help them grow spiritually. Uh, one for me is one that you may not even heard me talk about, but a guy named John Shaw. And John and Grace, his wife Grace, he had been a professor. Uh, he had taught theology and Bible for years. He had pastored local churches. And he had retired. And so I, it was my first time being a lead pastor in a church in West Michigan. And I was able to bring him on our staff as a calling pastor, as the one who would kind of visit on the shut-ins and check on them. And, and he was in a season of his life where he didn't want to lead the whole church, but that was a, a blessing for him. So I, I said to him, John, I would love just to, just to be around you and learn about Jesus from you. Could I take you out to lunch every so often and just ask, I'd give you questions in advance and you can just... Um, teach me. And he goes, you don't have to give me questions in advance. We'll just have lunch and just, well, let's just talk. And so we did. And every time we'd always go to Uncello's Italian food. And that's where the place he loved, right by where he lived. And uh, I remember one time I asked him the question, John, if you could just teach one more sermon, what would you preach? And he went on for an hour and a half. Hmm. And with, with tears in his eyes, out of a love to preach the word of God. And he just began talking about, and it would have been just basically sharing the gospel one more time. And it just so blessed me. And, th and then, and this was for years, we would just have lunches at Uncello's and I would ask him questions and I'd listen. And his wisdom, he, and he had, he had been a pastor for a lifetime and had retired. So he sort of took my hand and said, Kevin, let me help you along. Let me share my wisdom. And then the thing that was really, that always, I don't know why it's very, it's very touching to me, but I, when I'd be sitting in my office about every third or fourth week, he would come to church uh, on a Sunday morning. He'd get there early enough to, he'd come by my office He'd never knock on the door. He'd just walk in. He was John Shaw. He, so he just, he'd never knock. He'd just walk right in. He knew I'd be sitting there kind of looking at my notes and praying, getting ready for the service. He'd just kind of well early before sound check or any of that. And he'd just walk around my desk. He'd walk behind me. He'd put his hands on my shoulders and he would just pray. And I would begin to weep. And, I, and I'm not a big weeper, right. but I would just like, it was just like the presence of the Holy Spirit was on me. And, and, and I just thought, I want to have that kind of a prayer life, that kind of love for Jesus. So just being around him, having lunches, listening, but, but he, he, whether you call it mentoring, discipling, helping me grow in faith, I don't care what term you use. I just like, he helped me 
learn what Jesus looked like and become more like Jesus. And, and so he discipled me for probably three or four years, and it was a real blessing. I love that. That's a beautiful picture. Yeah. Uh, there's something special about someone coming behind you and yeah. praying for you yeah. that just, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a moving thing. I could see myself weeping because yeah. I'm already feeling that way. Just yeah. hearing you talk yeah. about that, that's yeah. a neat thing. What do you think most people think of when they hear the words discipleship and evangelism? Mm -hmm. I think when people hear the word discipleship, a lot of people think about a set program. Mm -hmm. They, they meet with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, they have a, a set plan, and uh, I think that that's how a lot of people think about discipleship. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, right. but it's just so much bigger than that. And I think when people think about evangelism, I think they uh, feel afraid. Mm -hmm. They think it means, oh, it means I got to go door to door. I have to knock on people's door, catch them at a bad time, and then try to share Jesus with them. Right. I think that those Sounds are, like fun. yeah, not, not <laughs> something not that, yeah. that, that we like to do or yeah, encourage right. people to do, um, as we talk so much about organically sharing mm -hmm. our faith. But yeah. I think that that's, I don't know, Kev, you? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, I think that that's absolutely accurate. I think that when it comes to discipleship, it's either a thing, this real in, kind of intense, intricate thing, or or people would go, I've heard, I've heard the word a lot, but I don't know. Right. And uh, which is one of the reasons why we've addressed this topic and really gone after it, because we want people to get a clear picture and a clear mm -hmm. vision. And then with evangelism, I think people's response is, I know it's something I don't like to do, or I don't do, but I don't want to do. And would you please stop talking about it? That's I think that's kind of the mindset. So right. yeah. So how would you two define mm -hmm. evangelism and discipleship? Yeah. Boy, I th I think I would I'll start with I'll start with evangelism. I would d define evangelism as just naturally sharing who Jesus is to you, how he's impacted your life, who he could be for someone else. It's it's. Part of it is loving and serving and caring for people, but that's really almost kind of pre-evangelism. Evangelism is the process of sharing the story of Jesus, who he is, what he's done, your story of Jesus, how he's transformed your life, uh, and, and then your stories of Jesus, how he continues to show up and do amazing things. And then as we share, if somebody if somebody says, you know, I want to know more about that, share a little bit more. And if somebody says, I want to know that Jesus, could I? Say, oh, absolutely. He's opened his arms to you and then sharing with somebody that he's as close as a prayer and just sort of, so evangelism is just in the flow of your life, letting people know that God is real. He loves them. He loves you. And out of his story and our story, inviting people to walk towards Jesus and hopefully one day say, I want to follow this Jesus. And I think, and I think it's way more complicated than we usually make it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I think discipleship is just, it happens um, anytime one person helps another person take a step closer in becoming more like Christ. Mm. It's just extending a hand and helping like like Mrs. Beery. I, I, I have to still call her Mrs. Beery. <laughs> um, but all she did was extend a hand to me, teach me a lesson. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I've grown in Christ likeness because of her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As Sherry was talking, I thought, of, I thought of this, that there's people that will say to me as a pastor, they'll say, well, does your church do discipleship? Right. And I'll say, oh yeah, we've got you know, great classes and small groups and we're mentoring children and youth. And they, yeah, but do you do discipleship? Right. And I'll say, well, yeah, we, you know, we, uh, we have people who are helping others grow in faith. We have women to women mentoring. You know, yeah, but do you do discipleship? And there's a point where I realize, oh, they mean something very, very, right. very specific right. uh, that isn't what I'm saying. And it usually means it's a very rigid, programmatic, one person to one person, uh, just interlocking their whole meshing their lives together and and the so well, like Jesus's disciples they quit their jobs and they stayed with him all the time for three years are you doing that and I'm thinking well <laughs> that's not real practical but I'm teaching my kids to love Jesus and I'm and Sherry and I are growing in faith together helping each other and, and I and I'm hopefully as I'm preaching and teaching helping people I, discipleship is those all those things and lots and lots it's more. It's just so much yeah. bigger yeah. and we do have opportunity even at Shoreline where we do have um, mentoring one-on-one. -on -one. We use curriculum and right. we use the scriptures. And yeah. so we're not saying we're against that. We're yeah. just saying that's only part of it. Yeah. It's so much bigger than that. And that's actually what I was already starting to think when yeah. you just said there, it's so much bigger than that. Yeah. 
I think for people who look at that as discipleship, yeah. it's actually quite restrictive. Yeah. They feel yeah. like we've got this great yeah. framework which makes it so successful, but in doing so, they completely disregard all the other yeah. avenues yeah. and ways and opportunities yeah. To, yeah. to help people grow in their faith yeah. when it's and so much more than that. And then you have lots of people who go, I could never disciple someone. Right. And you know, I want to say, no, you actually probably are. Yeah. With if your you're kids. Help, if you're, right. you're with your children. If you're... But there's parents who maybe don't even realize, oh, no, I should be teaching them to pray and to grow in the word. Mm -hmm. I can disciple them. But it's, it's not this massive program. It's a day by day walking with people. Yeah. I love that picture. You emphasize the fruit of the spirit is mm -hmm. essential for mm -hmm. um, the growth as a follower of Jesus yeah. or as a disciple. Yes. Um, why is the fruit of the spirit so important in this? Well, first... Uh, we know that it's the spirit in us that gives us the power yeah. and we can't live our lives in our own strength and what we really talk about how the fruit of the spirit acts like an umbrella over all the things that we're doing as we grow it superintends kind of our, our spiritual growth um, and it's so important because if we if we don't have the fruit of the spirit in us if we don't have love joy peace if we're not if we're not reading the word um and and figuring out how uh, we understand how god loves us and then how through the scriptures we can learn how to love people if we're just reading the bible and we don't experience love then it's just words and it's mm -hmm. it's not changing our lives so we we kind of we kind of say that it it superintends over all our spiritual growth of maturity the fruit of the spirit yeah, and the I think the danger is, if you go back to Jesus' day, there were people who knew exactly how to read the scriptures, mm -hmm. they knew how to pray, they knew how to worship and when to worship, and they had it, they had it right. all figured out, right? And Jesus said, you're missing the whole point. Why? Because their heart and their character was all messed up, but they did the behaviors. And this is why, I th this, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is about our character and our hearts and our souls, filled with, you know, with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness. You go to self-control, you go, oh, those things are about who I am. And if I'm doing religious stuff, but I'm not in love with Jesus mm -hmm. and caring about people, then I'm just doing religious stuff. And Jesus had a lot of, to say about mm -hmm. that. And it was yeah. very, very little of it was positive. Yeah. So. And without, you know, basically without the fruit of the Spirit growing in us, uh, what can tend to happen is legalism yeah. Yeah. and those things that do not bring others toward Jesus yeah. Yeah. and sadly away from him. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're not accomplishing yeah. what our goal is as Christ followers. Right. Mm -hmm. So you, you two wrote a book, Organic yeah. Disciples. Yeah. What, what kind of spurred you on? What, what motivated you or moved you to, to spend years mm -hmm. yeah. of, of time and energy, your heart, your life, everything yeah. into, into writing this book? Well, it's kind of, kind of interesting. It's got a backstory. And we've been teaching things about organic outreach, sharing our faith, and really about walking and growing in faith for over 30 years. As a couple, we've been had a chance to train leaders around the world and teach on this from Amsterdam to Auckland, New Zealand to El Salvador. I mean, God's allowed us to have a great experience with all this. But as we've been teaching people about reaching out and sharing their faith, we had lots of leaders starting to say, will you connect discipleship and evangelism? Will you connect them for us? Because there's, you guys talk about evangelism and there's good, great books on discipleship, but there's not, some, you know, somebody needs to connect the dots. And not saying that nobody's tried or that there aren't things out there, but people were looking, as we begin to share our thoughts on connecting the dots between them, uh, we had, we were particularly did a conference, a three-day conference in New Zealand, mm -hmm. and the uh, pastors kind of mobbed us afterwards and said, "You have to write a book about this. This has got to be your next book." <clears throat> and we had, we had finished writing the three book organic outreach series. We'd done some other things, and we were kind of like just sort of e exhausted. We'd poured ourselves out, and then people are saying, "You've got to do. You have to you know spend years creating a whole other thing on top of your normal work you do." Right. And we're like. Yeah, great. Thanks. Good input. You know? <laughs> but, but but we actually prayed about it and we we find we just felt like God said this is your next you you need to do this. This is this is kind of your next calling along with your local church ministry. You need to begin working on this. So we spent that was 4 years ago. Yeah, and I I think yeah. too we started to hear people talking about are you a discipleship church or are yeah. you you know are you about evangelism like you have to pick one yeah. right. and we're like no it's it's not that at all yeah. these two yeah. are together you, yeah. you don't separate them yeah. and we would hear that yeah. often yeah. and realized i think there is a, a place yeah. for a book yeah. like this and our goal is to take church. discipleship you know growing in christ 
and evangelism going with Christ into the world and and put them back the way God designed, which is together. Right. So Jesus, Jesus, after he had risen from the dead, before he ascended, he's with his disciples. It's, it's right before he returns to heaven. And he says, all power in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I've commanded you. And then Jesus says, and I'm with you to the very end of the age. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Jesus begins with, I have all power, mm -hmm. and he finishes with, I'll be with you. But in the middle, it's, now you go and make disciples. Now, you say, well, what does it mean to make disciples? Well, you're going to baptize them. So you're actually helping people come to faith in Jesus. But you're also teaching them all I've commanded you. So you're helping them grow in Jesus. So we're helping people toward Jesus to know him and then growing in that faith. And so, okay, there's evangelism, discipleship. They're bound together. And we want to bring those together in the heart of the church because they're together in the heart of God. Yeah. Well, yeah. and I think another passage to think of is Luke 19.10, which, you know, we say is the mission statement of Jesus mm -hmm. for he came to seek and save the lost. Mm -hmm. And if that was Jesus's mission and mm -hmm. discipleship is becoming more like him, mm -hmm. shouldn't that be our mission yeah. too? So I think that there's another passage that really puts these two together. Mm -hmm. you, you shouldn't separate them. Right. But we do that all the time. We do, we, we do. And yeah. so, you know, our hope in our book is that we we just kind of bring it back in, in understanding and language and, and lifestyle. Right. So a lot of what we've been talking about so far is about discipleship and growing in faith. How can a Christian know that they're growing in their faith? Hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it's interesting because you go, okay, well, physical growth, when you're a kid growing up, you know how tall you are, you know if you can lift so much weight or run a certain time. You can, okay, I can see where I'm progressing. Mm -hmm. Spiritually, so well, that's all on the inside. You can't really know. <clears throat> but but we don't think that's accurate. We actually think you can know you're growing in faith. If you look and say, well, how am I growing? Am I growing as a disciple? Okay, am I growing in, deeper in my faith and following Jesus? I think if you say, well, what did Jesus do? Mm -hmm. And how did he live? How did he think? How did he think? How did he treat people? How did he speak? And how do I become more like that? And so, you know, we've really looked and tried to identify what are those things that Jesus did that he calls and wants us to do. And then can we say, am I doing that more? Mm -hmm. So one of the things we talk about is, is Bible engagement, engaging with the scriptures. Do I read the scriptures? If you look at the life of Jesus, he loved the scriptures. He read the scriptures in his times of, uh, of pain and struggle and temptation and all the things he faced. It would be scripture that would come out of him. You go, okay, well, if that's what Jesus is like, and I'm a disciple, I'm supposed to be like Jesus. I should love the word. I should have it in my soul. Am I increasing in that? Am I growing in that over time? then I know I'm growing up as a disciple. And that's true for kind of all the different things that are indicators of how Jesus lived and how he wants us to live. And really, um, at our church, um, and Kevin, you might want to share a little bit more mm -hmm. because I think you were kind of in, in um, 2013 mm -hmm. when we uh, sat down with a team and kind of mm -hmm. developed what we call the seven spiritual markers. Yeah. Um, which I, I can I can tell you what they are, and I'll let Kevin share yeah. uh, how that kind of yeah. came about. But um, we talk about seven spiritual growth markers, and they are Bible engagement, mm -hmm. passionate prayer, wholehearted worship, humble service, joyful generosity, consistent community, and um, organic outreach. Mm -hmm. So those are our seven. Yeah. And you can share. Yeah, so the way we came up with these, and it's interesting, the process we went through, I think if almost any church in the world went through the same process, right. they'd come up with the same seven things. It wasn't like some genius idea. Right. We got together our children's leaders, our youth leaders, our men's and women's leaders, our adult leaders, uh, and we, over like eight, nine, ten months, we talked about it, we prayed about it, we looked at the scriptures, we said, okay, what are things that the way Jesus lived that reflect the way we should live, that we could look and say, am I growing in that? And so we came up with, you know, Bible engagement. Jesus loved the scriptures. He quoted the scriptures. He, um, he, he would teach from the scriptures. He would, he would cry out from his heart, scripture. On the cross, when Jesus, when Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting mm -hmm. Psalm 22. Any Jewish person in the first century who heard that would have gone Psalm 22. And the whole story of that Psalm would have come to their hearts. And so, and so we said, okay, Bible engagement, and we all agreed. And we also said it has to be something that you would think that kids should grow in, and youth should grow in, and adults should grow in, and people in America, and people in you know you know in 
in you know India, I mean, India, anywhere, pe people, people in in communist countries where this underground church they tell, but these are things that Christians do. All all Christians would say, yeah, knowing and loving and following the Bible, yeah, that's what Christians yeah. do, right? And then you know, passionate prayer, worshiping. We said, okay, these are all things. We but as we were working on it, it was interesting. Initially, we had the fruit of the spirit growing in the fruit of the spirit as one of the markers, and then we actually realized, wait a minute, mm -hmm. it's not so much a marker; it's more of the the umbrella over the marker. So we, so this was a process of thinking and right. talking and praying and negotiating together about these things. At one point we had prayer and worship together. And actually Sherry came to me in this process we were in and she was, uh, you know, she said, I think prayer and worship are distinct enough that they need to be separate markers. And we went back and talked with the team. We're like, right. yeah, they really do. And then joyful generosity. Uh, we were like, you know, is generosity really like that mm. significant of a marker uh, in terms of, it's one of the things that measures where my heart is with Jesus. Then you go, oh, wait a minute, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Right. Uh, you, you realize that there's more passages in the Bible about generosity and our resources than almost anything else. And you go, okay, yeah. So we said, no, that that's actually one of the things, am I growing in not only being generous, but doing it with a joyful heart? Mm -hmm. Does that show me growing in Christ? Yes, it does. So with these seven markers, and somebody might say, well, I can come up with an eighth one. That's great. Then you, then you write the, the addendum to the book or whatever. But, but you know, we felt like after about a year of talking and praying about it, those things were things that we could look at in children and youth and adults and say, if I'm growing in these with the fruit of the Spirit guiding me, I'm actually becoming more like Jesus. And that's it's good to kind of have a sense of that pathway. And that's what we're trying to create. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about these spiritual markers, you say that they're they're more of like a recipe than they are of a menu. Yeah. yeah. Tell yeah. us a little bit about, yeah. about what that means. Yeah. Well, I, I look at it like this: a menu. You go into you go into a restaurant and you get a menu, and you go and, and you look at it. And what do you get to do with the menu? You pick, get to pick what whatever you, like. you want. Right. I, this is what I feel like. This is what I want. That's a menu. What's a recipe? Somebody says, okay, this is how you make grandma, grandma's chocolate chip cookies. It has walnuts. It has chocolate chips, and, and then there's portions, and you put them in there. And if you don't, if you use different, you know, different items, I'm not going to use walnuts. I'm going to use raisins. Well, first of all, please. <laughs> but, um, you know, but, but it's like you say, I, somebody's go, well, these are wonderful, but they're not grandma's chocolate chip cookies. You know, you put in butterscotch chips and you put in raisins and you go, well, there's a recipe. So these, these seven markers aren't things you get to choose. You don't go, okay, I like prayer and Bible study. I don't like generosity and organic outreach <clears> and sharing my faith. So I'm not going to do those. I, well, no, it's not up to us. This is the recipe for a mature Christian life. And we're growing in all of these. So kind of put them together, mix with generous portions of the fruit of the Spirit, and live a Christian life. Yeah, I love that picture. Yeah, That's it is great. a great picture. Yeah, mm. you came up with that. I love that. I did come up, and I'm not even a real cooking kind of guy. <laughs> so, and you love raisins too, I can tell. I'm, I'm a huge <laughs> fan of dried up grapes. Yes, who wouldn't be? Well, many people see discipleship and their mm. spiritual growth as a, a profoundly personal mm. and inner mm -hmm. thing. Um, it kind of almost seems to be it's it's them and Jesus, mm -hmm. and you can yeah. stay out of my business. Yeah. yeah, is this an accurate? Is this, is, should this be accurate? Is yeah, this accurate yeah. in your mind? You yeah. know, it's, it's, it's so interesting when you think about the Bible and you think about what the pictures God has given us of ourselves as the family of God, mm -hmm. um, that we're part of a body, mm -hmm. that we're his children. All the pictures are life together. Mm -hmm. God has hardwired us for community. He has right. made us. That's how yeah. he has designed us. And so when we kind of make that stand, we're kind of going against the grain mm -hmm. of the way that our creator created us. And uh, so yeah. I, I think yeah. that um, it, it's our design. And, and there's nothing wrong with, uh, there's nothing wrong with saying, I have a deep and personal love for Jesus. Right. Uh, there's nothing wrong with sitting quietly by yourself and reading your Bible, but it's not. That's not all it is. And discipleship, by definition, is not just about me and Jesus, hmm. because if discipleship is about helping others yes. grow in faith, I can't do that alone. Right. Uh, there, there, there's a, a bigger picture here, and so um, and I don't know if we if we talked about it, if we're going to jump. I think we're going to talk mm -hmm. about the four generations, yeah. but it's, that's my next question. Okay. Yeah. 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 But just you know th th that that if there's a, there, it's more than just me and Jesus. God's, like Sherry said, God has made us for community, but we also become stronger in our faith. If it wasn't for a John Shaw in my mm -hmm. life, I would yes. not be as strong as I am in faith. So he true. took my hand. He helped me grow. And that's actually helped me be able to do the same with others. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and earlier you quoted out of Matthew and go and make disciples of all nations. Yeah. Um, and then you do talk about four generations. And mm -hmm. I think this is a beautiful picture. Yeah. So I'd love to have the audience here. Yeah. Um, when we talk yeah. about four generations when mm -hmm. it comes to discipleship, mm -hmm. what is that? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. What does that look like? Can you unpack that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, well, we actually um, go to a very specific passage in the Bible. It's a small verse. It's Second Timothy 2.2, 2, and I'll just read it. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. We believe that this verse, we actually call this the 222 lifestyle. And we believe that uh, what you can find in this verse is really the Apostle Paul talking about investing his life into Timothy. Mm -hmm. And then he's calling Timothy to invest into reliable people. And then a fourth generation, he says, and then you also teach other people. And so you have four generations of spiritual growth, the 2 2, two lifestyle. So exactly. And I love that passage with the Apostle Paul where there's just the sense that we're not in this alone. So so Paul, you know, you know, Paul is really saying, you know, and through the through the epistles we realize that Paul is growing in his faith. He's dy- he's got a dynamic faith and love for Jesus, but he's helping Timothy along, you know, that generation too. Mm-hmm. But he's saying, Timothy, this isn't enough that I'm helping you and that you're growing in your faith. You help someone else. But Timothy, that's not enough. That third generation, you've got to somehow equip them to help somebody else. And here's the picture that I get in my mind. Starting from the, from Jesus and the, and the disciples 2,000 years ago, everyone who knows Jesus had somebody take their hand and help them. And person to person, and, and until Jesus returns again. Uh, you know, Keith, you've got, you've got three daughters mm-hmm. and a son. And you're doing all you can to take their hand and help them grow in faith. But you don't want to stop there. You want them to pour not only to their kids someday if God gives them kids, but you'd love them to pour into friends. And you, if you if they yeah. came and said, Dad, there's this person who's younger in faith, but I'm helping them grow in faith, you'd be like, Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, that'd be amazing. <laughs> Praise God, right? It'd be that's your desire. And they said, as a matter of fact, that person who I'm helping along in their faith, they're not helping somebody else. You'd be going, Where's it gonna end? Well, it's gonna end when Jesus returns. That's well, that's the church. Well, and you think about as the disi- disciples were um learning from Jesus, if they stopped there. What what it, how it would have impacted us if they all just said me and Jesus? Yes, that's all it would have been. Yeah, that would be a disappointment. Yeah, yeah. Would, we wouldn't be sitting here. Yeah. Wow. yeah, yeah. What advice would you give parents? As you said, I I want to invest in my in my children, and I would love to see them invest mm-hmm. in their children and their grandchildren. Um, what advice yeah. would you give me and other parents? Yeah, grandparents and helping yeah. the next yeah. generations yeah. grow in their faith. I, I think to think of discipleship as we have defined it, it's like every moment that you're doing something. So when you're uh, teaching and just praying with your children, you are discipling them to kind of give yourself credit, you know? And then as you think about it more, I really believe that you'll become even more intentional and realize, oh yeah, that is a call that I have on my life. I think that as you think more about li- doing it in little ways, it will grow you and help you to do it even yeah. more. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think this is when we talk about something being organic rather than just programmatic or planned. If if I said to you, okay, Keith, listen, every week spend at least five minutes with each of your kids reading the Bible. That'd be, that'd be a good thing to do. Sure. But if I said to you, Keith, Keith, when you're learning things in the scriptures, share them with your kids. Mm. Um, when you hear something in a sermon that really strikes you, you say, hey, I can, I can tell you about something in the sermon today, or you're listening to a podcast and it really, really, you learn something new. What if in little bits throughout the week, you were just sharing those things with your kids, you know, praying with your kids and be like, okay, we're going to have a prayer at family meals. That's great. But what if each time one of your kids shared an incredible joy, you said, hey, listen, uh, can we pray and thank Jesus for that? Or even better yet, if you just would go, Jesus, thank you for Finn mm-hmm. and the fact that he, you know, he made it through this day by making good choices and he had a great day. Just thank you so much. And then you just go on with your day. And later on, you know, you, you know, mm-hmm. Hannah's, you know, Hannah's in town now visiting, you know, and Hannah says, Dad, this thing happened and it was kind of a challenging thing. And, and you just put your hand around her, your arm around her shoulder and say, Jesus, be with Hannah. Give her wisdom to handle that situation. And it's funny, the, I'm going to share this. Sherry has taught me a lot about prayer. And I've got the point now where with Sherry and lots of my closest friends, even with our congregation when I'm preaching, it's people say like, you start praying and I'm not like ready for it. You don't say let's pray. And all of a sudden I'm like, oh, whoa, we're praying now. And they do, but I kind of like it, but it's kind of like you surprise us. Um, but I was I was out of town uh, and I was talking, with, I was in this kind of dinner setting with a bunch of people. And the woman I was next to, she shared about a child of hers going through a really hard time, really struggling. She's not, this woman's not a believer. 
I just began to pray for her son. And she like leaned over against me and, and didn't begin weeping, but she just kind of like would just, she just almost like melted. Here's a woman who's not a Christian, but, and you said, well, were you discipling her? Well, in a sense, I was showing her that as a follower of Jesus, you can talk to God in any moment about anything. That's helping her get a, st she's not a believer yet, but it's maybe one step closer. Is there really a God who listens when we pray, who hears us? But something happened in her heart. It was real. The spirit was present. Um, so just to pray with your kids and your, and if you have grandkids with your grandkids to, to not to say you have to go to church, but to teach them what worship is, that it's part of life. And just, to, so just to pour your life, what are you learning? What are you growing in in faith? Share it. Well, what if they don't want to hear about it? You know, if you're excited about it and if you, um, just start kind of talking about things that you're excited about. I think that for them, oftentimes they'll be excited. Now, if they say, hey, you know, if they're a little older, dad, that's not my thing, then okay, be sensitive to that. But just try to let it flow out of you. That's my encouragement. I was actually thinking of a situation just with one of our boys. Uh, when he was young already, like first grade or second, he would come home and he mm. would share about particular classmates that maybe were struggling. And I could tell that he or was left out. Yeah, and, or yeah. left out. Yeah. And he would actually tell me about that. And mm. then I realized in that moment that I was listening and kind of caring for him as he was seeking to care for his you know, little classmates. But then I knew there was this moment that I needed to take this and mm -hmm. teach him that he could pray for other people. Yeah. So already first and second grade, when he mm -hmm. would bring up something about a classmate and uh, it was appropriate timing. And I just say, hey, why don't we pray mm -hmm. for that person? Yeah. And so already at a young age, I was mm -hmm. teaching him that one way you care for someone yeah. is you can pray for them too. Yeah. And so to find those opportunities, yeah. even as you're just parenting or grandparenting mm -hmm. and just extending it yeah. um, is. And I got to tell you that same, that same son, um, we were on a little family vacation at a lake and some people were going to join us for lunch. So I said, Hey, can you run over to the store and grab a few more extra supplies? Cause there's more people coming for lunch. And he should have popped over there and been back in a short period of time. Well, it took a lot long, longer than I thought it should have. So he came back and I said, what happened? What took so long? And he said, well, you know, I was shopping. And I saw this lady and she was trying to reach something up on an upper shelf. She couldn't reach it. So I just helped her get it. And he said, and then I just said hi to her and asked her how she was doing. And she said, well, actually, my husband passed away this last week. Hmm. And he said, so I just talked with her and I prayed for her. And as he began to share this with her, his eyes kind of welled up with tears. And he said, he's got the tenderness of Sherry's heart. And he, he said, I, I, I just was talking to her and praying for her. And you know, he learned that by watching his mom hmm. do that with him for kids in third and fourth grade. And now here he is as a young adult, and he's living that way. That's discipleship. discipleship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Earlier we were talking about churches, and someone can ask, is your church uh, an evangelistic church, or is your church about discipleship? Mm -hmm. And yeah. almost like you had to choose one yeah. or the other, or yeah. they're pitted against each other. Yeah. Um, I think we've already established they're not really yeah. enemies yeah. of one another. Right. But can you kind yeah. of unpack that a little yeah. bit more in the relationship and yeah. inner workings of evangelism yeah. and discipleship? Yeah, we've come up with a little statement. It's kind of three lines, and we think it kind of crystallizes that. So the first line is, uh, discipleship and evangelism are not enemies. They're not at battle with each other. The second is, discipleship and evangelism are not just friends. Like They're not just pals who kind of hang out. But the third line kind of really clarifies it that discipleship and evangelism are marriage partners. Mm. And the Bible says, you know, the two become one. We have to look at discipleship and evangelism. When Discipleship is helping people grow in their faith, and evangelism is helping people come to know Jesus. So, so really, you're walking with people toward Jesus and encouraging them, praying for them, sharing as you, as you can. When they come to faith in Jesus, they continue to walk and grow in Jesus. It's just, it's, it's just the same journey. And I've been... I've been had people ask, well, can you disciple someone before they're a Christian? Isn't that evangelism? You say, well, it's evangelism, but also in a sense, it is discipleship. Why? You're helping them take steps toward Jesus, closer to Jesus. And we've had people in this at this church who've come to this church and started serving in ministries, being involved in the life of the church, sometimes for years before they finally become a Christian. Hmm. But they're having people, Christians, take their hand and helping them grow in faith. I had one person who became a believer here, and I said, you know, now that you're a Christian, you need to get some Christians around you to help you grow. Oh, I already, I'm involved in the, the food pantry, or it was the clothing closet ministry, mm -hmm. and there's three women that are already helping me grow in faith. I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> it, 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 all, it all fits together. That's neat. What, what could happen if mm -hmm. the church as a whole or mm -hmm. Christians as individuals just more and more really understood how evangelism and discipleship 
are connected and how they could keep them connected. What what could you imagine happening mm -hmm. from that? I, I just think it's an adventure. Yeah. I yeah. just, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, every moment of every day is a chance to just say, how do I, here's a person who doesn't know Jesus. How do I love them? How do I serve them? How do I, in the right moment, share my story or, or Christ's story? Here's a person who knows Jesus, but we don't just sort of automatically grow. How can I take their hand? How can I help them grow? And so like Sherry said, it's an adventure. It's like, what's gonna happen today? I don't know. I might have three opportunities or 20 opportunities to take someone's hand and help them take one more step closer. If I'm like, Keith, discipleship is you gotta spend some time with somebody four days a week, at least an hour each time. You have to go through this curriculum. You have to write down notes. You have to, you can do that. And I've had people invest in me at that level and it's wonderful. That's discipleship. Right. But if I understand that discipleship is you know, at this moment, I have a chance to kind of help this person who loves Jesus, love him a little bit more, learn something more about prayer. This, this person who doesn't yet know Jesus, walk a little bit closer to knowing who he is, take that next step closer to Jesus. You know, that That's, mm -hmm. well, you get to the end of a day and you say, mm -hmm. this is glorious, that God could use me, an ordinary person, in simple daily ways, to help people walk towards Jesus and getting to know him, and once they know him, to take steps in growing. And I'm growing, Others are helping me and I'm helping them. Man, what could be better? One of the most freeing things that I have done in my walk to share, uh, to grow um, in, in Christ-like ways and to share God's love is really just to start each day humbly. Just to, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is a, is a physical thing I do. I get on my knees and I just say to God, God, thank you for this day. And kind of getting on my knees, and, and you know, there's a few times when I've had back surgery that I couldn't do it, so you don't have to get on your knees. But there's something for me doing it physically just kind of um, puts me in that place of humility. Like, God, I'm here today to live for you. How, you know, how will you use me today, God? I just want you to know I'm available to help others to know you better, to help others to grow. Um, and so would you open doors and sort of the freedom to allow Jesus to lead me every single day. Mm. Well, you just reminded me of the, the getting on your knees. And, and then when we talk about discipleship, right, it doesn't always have to be intentional. And sometimes you might not even notice it. Um, and I might actually get choked up because yeah, yeah. it's impacted me mm. profoundly. Yeah. Yeah. Some years ago, you talked about having to roll out of bed yes. and get on your knees because of a physical condition yes, yeah, that I yeah. had to do it. Yeah, well, that's right. And that just impacted me so much where mm. I've implemented that in my life. Really? Mm. That's neat. And on the days when I roll out of bed and on my knees, yeah. the day's totally different. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Totally different yeah. than the days where I yeah. spryly jump yeah. out of bed, you know? Yeah. yeah. There yeah. really is something special. And so yeah. you've discipled me mm. through yeah. that, mm. yeah. through almost even like a random statement that yes. you made that you yeah. didn't even know yeah. how much that's just... Penetrate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's you. beautiful. Yeah, yeah thank and you. I think about how we started with you were talking about uh, Mrs. Beery, yes. mm -hmm. right? Yes, and how her, that one thought as an adult mm. now, as somebody who's you know sixty years old, you know, you go, okay, I still think about that. Mm -hmm. It still helps me. And even and, as I've yeah. shared, even as Keith is just talking about that, I've shared that with many people here in different teaching segments mm -hmm. and just one on one. I've had so many people come back to me mm -hmm. and say, that has really changed my life. Mm -hmm. I even had one mom that shared that her daughter was having a hard time sleeping at night, that she was afraid. She remembered that I had shared what Mrs. Beery shared with me, shared it with her daughter. We talk about mm -hmm. that yeah. four generations, yes. right? And yeah, um, yeah it, it's quite, that's quite beautiful. Yeah. This, is, this is discipleship. Yeah, and discipleship really does start with us yeah. personally growing in our relationship with Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Um, what encouragement would you yeah. give to a person who's yeah. really wanting to grow and deepen yeah. their walk with Jesus? Mm -hmm. I, the first thing I would jump in with is I would say, dare to look for people who are further down the road spiritually with you, kind of higher up the mountain, climbing towards Jesus, and say, can I take your hand? Mm -hmm. Where sometimes we're kind of like, well, I got I to do it myself. It's like, no, we don't. No, we don't. And so the, I've, I've reached out to people through the years and, and Carl, Carl Overbeek, who's a retired pastor, uh, Paul Cedar, who's a retired pastor, uh, where I've said, would you invest in my life spiritually? Would you every, you know, every four to six or eight weeks or so spend an hour with me on a Zoom call or on a phone call and just um, 
just help me learn how to live more for Jesus. Well, Kevin, you're almost 60 years old. Yeah. And I still, so that would be my big encouragement is, is let someone else take, because if you had let someone else take your hand and they're growing you, you'll probably be like, oh, I got to do this for somebody else. And then you start, then that chain reaction begins to happen. That's what I'd share. And, and maybe just do a little bit of uh, studying on the seven spiritual growth markers that we've been yeah. talking about. And we actually have an assessment that people can do, a self-assessment. You can yeah. either find it on our Shoreline website or you can find it on Organic Disciples dot org website and take the assessment yeah. see how you're doing um have a have a has a have a marker where you're where you're at right now and how are ways that you mm -hmm. can grow yeah. and so taking that assessment yeah. might be a, a great next step yeah and it's it's free and it's accessible to anyone in the world that has a computer or a phone to get on and, and look it up and it it takes 10 12 minutes and you get immediate feedback and that feedback gives you a bunch of different ideas. If you go, boy, I really want to grow in this area. Well, here's 37 ways you can grow. You go, okay, well, I'll pick a couple that work for me and I'll start down that road. And that's uh, just a fun, practical thing that's there online and it's accessible to anybody. Well, I think looking into those spiritual markers, mm -hmm. taking that assessment is quite a bit of homework for our audience yeah. to, to go from Don't here. Don't be overwhelmed, people, right? <laughs> so I think this is probably a good time good. for us yeah. to, to end. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'm looking yeah. forward to our, our future sessions where we can really learn to, to become organic disciples. Thank Thank you. Thanks, Key. Yeah. Whether you're listening on your podcast app or watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe if you want to hear more. Thanks for listening.